Hello Eater, Sky here, and it's time for us to add rotary wing birds to the channel. And the first step in this glorious trip will be a simple and beloved Soviet workhorse. Today we will walk through the blooming, endless fields of Russia and get acquainted with a machine that feels right at home on those fields. You've already seen the preview, so you can guess what we're discussing today. I present to you the brainchild of Mikhail Mil, the Mi-2 helicopter. In the 1950s, the main light Soviet helicopter was the Mi-1. Well, not that there were a lot of helicopters at that time. It was a wonderful device, with a maximum takeoff mass of about 2.3 tons, accommodating a couple of people and 250 kilograms of cargo, something like the modern Robinsons. The helicopter was good for its time, but its capabilities were modest. The main reason for this was the engine. Piston, hefty and taking up most of the interior space. The 50s were still a time when helicopters already appeared, but did not quite become what we know now. Gas turbine engines were smaller, lighter and more powerful than their piston cousins, potentially providing breakthrough advantages. The problem was in the quite questionable resource and reliability. Aviators at first were afraid to replace the classic piston with a turbine in a rotary wing machine. But by the end of the decade, their confidence increased. Helicopters with turboshaft engines quickly conquered the skies around the world, including the USSR. Why at that time the Mi-6 rose into the sky, a huge helicopter to put it mildly, and the piston machine standing next to it, which had quickly become relics of antiquity, looked somewhat awkward. The engineers of the Mil Design Bureau decided to handle this situation. The prospect for development of the helicopter already in the early stages of design was very bright, and despite the fact that it was initially viewed as exclusively civilian, over time the military also became interested in it. Fortunately, the expected performance was pretty decent, while the Army and the Air Force had a need for a light helicopter for a long time, at least for flight training. In 1960, the Mil Design Bureau received an official decree on the creation of a machine that received the design index V2. At first, the helicopter builders tried to take as much as possible from the already worked out Mi-1. In fact, it initially seemed that the future helicopter would be just a modification with a gas turbine engine. But over time, the number of innovations grew, and it soon became clear that very little legacy remained. In fact, they had a completely new machine on their hands. Let's see what they created. In general, the V2 was a completely logical continuation of the Mi-1, and in terms of its overall layout, it is quite consistent with the classic helicopters of its time, and ours too. The design is all metal, the cockpit for the crew and passengers, above it is the power plant with the main rotor, behind the tail boom with the tail rotor on it. The landing gear is tricycle with a steering nose wheel. The controversial point of the new power plant was the question of how many engines to install. On the one hand, economically and technologically it was better to put one. It was easier and cheaper for a light civilian helicopter. On the other hand, the power of one engine might not have been enough, and reliability, although it increased, was far from ideal. As a result, it was decided to install two GTD350 turboshaft engines. Two motors gave out about 800 horsepower, against 580 on the AI-26 from the Mi-1. At the same time, two turboshaft engines together weighed 120 kilograms less than one piston, not to mention the dimensions. Quite a vivid example of bonuses, which at that time seduced the helicopter builders so much. The main rotor is three-bladed, with all the required functionality, plus the tail rotor respectively is two-bladed, on the edge beam slightly raised up. There is almost no empennage on the helicopter, even the tail is a bare beam, except that you can see a small stabilizer on it, which turns automatically in accordance with the thrust of the main rotor. The power plant was placed in a separate volume under the fairing above the cabin. Two engines in front of the gearbox, plus additional units and a cooling system. All elements were placed as compactly as possible, but this added height to the entire assembly, so the superstructure of the power plant above the cabin is quite large, at least compared to the overall dimensions of a rather small helicopter. 
The helicopter also has an anti-icing system. The engineers have applied all their skills to lighten and simplify the system as much as possible while maintaining functionality. On many lightweight models it is not used at all, too heavy. But without it, in Soviet and Russian northern conditions, obviously no one would be making a helicopter. It is curious, heating was installed on the propeller blades and on the cockpit glazing, but only on the part of the windshield on the left, in front of the pilot. The air intakes on the engines do not have special heating, but these thick rims at the inlet are in fact the tanks of the oil system, which, passing through the mechanisms of the power plant, remains hot all the time, preventing the air intakes from freezing and along the way cooling down, here and in the radiator next to it. The increase in the size of the superstructure and the previously described dimensional advantages of turboshafts gave the helicopter something that its predecessor badly lacked – inner space. You can enter the helicopter through three doors. Two in the front open the way to the front seats, and one door in the back on the left side. A large one that allows passengers to enter the cabin or bring in cargo. In the front of the fuselage there are two seats for pilots, or a pilot with a passenger. Despite its age, the Mi-2 is already a pretty classic helicopter, so the surroundings are quite familiar. White glazing, control knobs in their places, and a small dashboard. There are no fashionable glass cockpits with electronic interfaces, but more or less, helicopter pilots will not get lost here. The control is boosted, but given the size of the machine, in theory if the support fails, the helicopter will remain controllable, although it will become tighter. Behind the cockpit is a cabin, accommodating up to 9 people. The volume there is quite decent, so the space was actively used not only for passenger traffic, but also for cargo, cargo passenger, air medical options and so on, as long as imagination allowed it. This is one of the clear bonuses of compact turboshafts. If the Mi-2 was piston, the engine would most likely eat up most of this space. There is another door in the cabin, however behind it there is not some special cargo hold. Only a little space for equipment, plus the tail boom is visible here from the inside. The main fuel tank is located under the floor. Well, not quite under it. The big section in the middle of the cabin is this tank. Plus on the sides of the fuselage two cylindrical tanks are suspended, which can hold fuel or some other liquids, for example chemicals for spraying fields. Agriculture was to become one of the main future tasks. Military suspensions are also taken into account here. The Mi-2 can be equipped with several types of cannons, machine guns, unguided and guided missiles. This feature became popular in some local conflicts, but did not get widespread use, as the military soon got their hands on the great and terrible Mi-24. The helicopter was equipped with an external suspension mount, so it could handle some oversized cargo weighing up to 800 kilograms. The landing gear is tricycle, non-retractable. The front leg is swivel, quite common. The main support is a pair of large wheels with shock absorbers and brakes fixed in the pyramidal metal structure. Simple, cheap and rough, but with a bonus. Since in the struggle for the interior space the engineers tried to remove everything unnecessary from the cockpit, they brought the gas for pneumatics here. The rigid structural elements of the struts are also gas tanks. Already in 1961, the first prototype was assembled at the Mille plant near Moscow. Yes, everything was done quickly then. In September 1961, the helicopter took off for the first time and began a series of tests and certification. During the tests, the helicopters were flown very actively and even managed to set records, for example a maximum speed of 269 km per hour, or 145 knots. But these were nevertheless records and not ordinary operation. On average, the indicators also turned out to be very good, at about 190-200 km per hour, or 110 knots cruising speed. Range of about 580 km, dynamic ceiling of 4 km with 2 km in hover. By 1963 the first stage of testing was completed and the helicopter, finally named Mi-2, was recommended for the start of mass production. Interestingly, it was decided to launch the serial production of the newest Soviet helicopter at the facilities of the Pezetel plant in Poland. 
This plant was already quite actively engaged in the production of Soviet aviation equipment. Most of the An-2 came from there, as well as more vicious machines, for example the MiG-15 and MiG-17. And also, the Mi-1 under the SM-1 index was being made there too. The first serial Mi-2 of Polish production took off in 1965. It took a lot of time to finalize the machine, as well as to adapt it for full-fledged operation in a wide range of functions, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that the helicopter was changing quite actively during the first years. Tests of the Mi-2 were completed in fact only by 1967, and it was ready to start full-scale work, successfully replacing outdated piston helicopters. The international premiere of the Mi-2 was held in the same 1967 at the Paris Air Show, where it showed itself very well – a light civilian helicopter. Unusual, given that the public at the Soviet exposition was more accustomed to giant flying buildings. The Mi-2 quickly received the NATO name, Hoplite, in honor of the ancient Greek heavy-armed infantryman. The Mi-2 quickly conquered the skies of its homelands, the USSR and Poland, and then began to be actively exported, scattering both throughout the rest of the countries of the socialist camp and in general around the world. By the end of the 1970s, the Mi-2, the number of which was already measured in thousands, got in a sense a secondary market, when the state structures of the owner countries began to resell their machines. And so, the helicopters dispersed all over the world, and even ended up in the United States. For private owners, an exotic Soviet machine is always interesting. In the USSR and the socialist countries, the helicopter was very actively used for local civilian transportation, in agriculture, as medical, patrol, training, and in general anything else. For a long time, it, by and large, occupied the whole niche of light helicopters, given that the Soviet helicopter industry was clearly more interested in heavier machines. Serial production lasted for decades, and was wrapped, in fact, only in the early 1990s. In total, more than 5400 Mi-2 helicopters of all versions were produced. Of course, most of the machines no longer fly, but given the initial number, a small amount is hundreds of units in dozens of countries. In large Russian structures, the Mi-2 of course has already been replaced by newer helicopters of various types, but in general aviation they are still popular, so the chopper is still a frequent resident of small airfields throughout the country. And this resident is quite alive. Of course now there are not so many helicopters as before, but they fly, are serviced and even modernized with the replacement of engines for more powerful ones. Our today's Mi-2, like its local brothers, feels great and will fly for a very long time, delighting pilots, passengers and onlookers on the ground. For today, I think we can complete the helicopter adventures. I look forward to a lot of nostalgia and philosophy in the comments, as well as likes and subscriptions to the channel. And if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind-the-scenes content or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights and soft landings to you, sometimes vertical.